What's up dogs? In this video we're going to look at what is probably the most controversial part of the philosophy of Nelson Goodman, his uh, idea of world making. Uh, now world making uh, involves two claims. First, uh, pluriworldism, the claim that there is a plurality of actual worlds. Um, so in claiming that there is a plurality of worlds, Goodman is not talking about the possible worlds of modality. He's not a modal realist like David Lewis. No, Goodman means that there are literally many real, actual worlds. Uh, a single individual will inhabit many of these actual worlds over their lifetime. And second, irrealism, uh, which says that worlds are constructed by cognitive activities. Uh, more precisely, worlds are dependent on what Goodman calls versions, where versions are constructed by us. Now, when Goodman says that we make or construct worlds, uh, note that making does not involve physically putting items together, as when a person bakes a cake by putting together ingredients and then physically modifying them. Worlds are products of our conceptual activities, uh, our languages and other representational systems. As Goodman puts it, and I quote, Not all making is a matter of moulding mud. The world making mainly in question here is making not with hands but with minds, or rather with languages or other symbol systems. Yet when I say that worlds are made, I mean it literally. So Goodman's claim is that we inhabit not one actual world, but many actual worlds, and these worlds are not discovered but made by us. Um, now it's important to bear in mind that pluriworldism and irrealism are two separate positions. Both of them constitute Goodman's world making. Uh, it would be possible to hold that there is a plurality of actual worlds, but they're not made by us. Uh, Israel Scheffler has defended this kind of view. Uh, similarly, it would be possible to hold that the world is made by us, but there's no plurality, uh, that we, you know, we converge on a, a single unique world. That's maybe the sort of position that was held by Kant. Anyway, Goodman affirms both of them. Um, and this does make him fairly unique among analytic philosophers in that he defends a, a really quite radical kind of constructivism and, and relativism. Um, you know, we, he, he says, you know, we literally make the world and different people make different worlds. OK, so that's the basic idea. So why does Goodman hold this position? Uh, well, it's worth saying at the outset that many of Goodman's writings on this subject are rather succinct and he, he does have a somewhat opaque style. So there's certainly room for interpretation about what exactly Goodman's arguments are. But a key idea for Goodman is the notion of a version. Uh, to quote Goodman, making right versions is to make worlds. So there are many right versions. Uh, versions are made by us and right versions correspond to worlds. Uh, now, as Alexander Deklos in his article, Goodman's Many Worlds puts it, a version is any description, representation, or depiction of reality. A version consists of symbols in any medium, uh, words, pictures, sounds, numerals, whatever. Um, it's Whenever we create a representation of reality, we are creating a version. So here are some examples of versions. There's uh, Ptolemy, Ptolemy's ge geocentric model and Copernicus's heliocentric model of the solar system. Uh, Whitehead's definition of geometrical points as classes of nesting volumes uh, and paintings by Van Gogh or Canaletto. So as you can see, there's an enormous range of different versions. Scientific theories, mathematical systems, artistic conventions, uh, all of these can constitute versions. Versions consist of symbols that stand for or represent things in the world. Now then the basic idea behind world making is this. The way the world is depends on the version. Indeed, we can't talk about a world independent of our representations. Uh, anytime we describe the way the world is, anytime we try to describe the world, we have to do so from a particular frame of reference with particular representational conventions. And if we ask the question of, you know, what is the world like independently of, of any particular version, independently of any particular frame of reference or representation, nothing can be said. Um, then there the, the first must be some means of describing or representing or classifying. Versions are what you know partition the world, but the key claim, there are many true versions. 
So there are many worlds, many worlds made by many versions. Um, we inhabit many different actual worlds by adopting different versions to represent reality. Now, it's common enough to suppose that there may be different but equally adequate uh, representations of reality. Where Goodman goes further than most other philosophers is that he denies that there is any sense to the idea that these are different representations of the same reality or the same underlying facts. Uh, for Goodman, the notion of the same underlying facts, independent of any version, is, is just totally empty. Okay, so I've, I've said that quite... Um, that, that, that was quite a, a brief presentation of, of, of the idea. Um, and, I mean, Goodman's position is a fairly radical one, so um, that, that might be confusing. So uh, let's look in a bit more detail at, uh, at Goodman's argument. So the central argument in Goodman's work is what uh, Alexander Deklos calls Goodman's many worlds argument. Now, Goodman never himself presents uh, a formalization of the argument in, in quite this way. Uh, so I'm going to state this in two different ways. One way to put the argument is like this. So there are alternative versions, alternative incompatible versions that have equal claims to the truth. So that is to say there are alternative versions that are just as good uh, at representing the phenomena, at achieving our ep epistemic goals. Uh, so it, there, there appear, in other words, to be conflicting true versions. There are versions that conflict, but that both seem to be true. And uh, we will look at some examples of these apparently conflicting true versions later. Um, but So this is the central claim. There, there appear to be conflicting true versions. And then in response to this, we have four options. So number one, we might say that the conflicting uh, versions are true of one and the same world. Number two, we might say that only one of the conflicting versions is true, uh, or only one proposition from any you know, given set of conflicting propositions is true. Three, we might say that the versions actually don't really conflict. They can be reconciled with each other. So, you know, there's not really two incompatible representations that have equally good epistemic status um, because no, they, they are compatible, they can be reconciled. Final option is that the conflicting versions are true for different worlds. And then, of course, Goodman is going to argue that there are cases where options A, B and C are unacceptable. So in some cases, we're forced to say that there are different actual worlds. OK, as I say, um, that's, that's one way to present the argument. Uh, another way to present the argument, and this is given in Deklos's article, uh, is as follows. Premise one there are true conflicting versions. Premise two, to each true version answers a world. Uh, Sub-conclusion, either true conflicting versions answer to one and the same world, or they answer to different worlds. Premise three, true conflicting versions cannot answer to one and the same world. So, conclusion, true conflicting versions answer to different worlds. Um, so, there are many different worlds made by the different versions. OK, we'll go through this form of the argument. Um, and we'll st so let's start with premise one, um, the claim that there are true conflicting versions. So the, the, the claim here is there are cases where a version will assert that P and another one will deny that P, but where both versions are true. Uh, there are many conflicting ways of describing or representing the world that are, they're both true. Um, and, I mean, this really is, is, is the key premise of Goodman's argument. This is the premise that uh, kind of bears most of the weight. This is the one that most people are going to be inclined to reject. Um, so why should we believe this? Why should we believe that, uh, it can, that there are cases where both P and not P are true? So Goodman gives a number of uh, examples of true conflicting versions. Uh, his favourite example concerns motion. So we have uh, E1, the Earth is at rest, E2, the Earth moves. These two propositions are conflicting. Uh, the same object cannot be both at rest and moving at the same time, because you know, to say that something is moving is just to say that it isn't at rest. Now, in physics, of course, motion is relative to one's frame of reference. Um, so we have to ask, what is the perspective from which we are speaking? You know, what do we take as fixed? If I take, for instance, Exeter as a fixed point, 
if I'm looking at the world, measuring the world from the perspective of Exeter, then E1 is true and E2 is false. On the other hand, if I take the sun as a fixed point, as I might do if I'm constructing a model of the solar system or something like that, then E2 is, uh, is, is true and E1 is false. Um, so you know, more generally, from the geocentric viewpoint, the geocentric perspective, E1 is true. And from the heliocentric viewpoint, E2 is true. Um, and of course, from uh, other other viewpoints, you know, I mean, from the heliocentric viewpoint, the Earth revolves about the sun. From other viewpoints, the Earth will trace a variety of different courses as well. If you look at it from the perspective of Mars, then E2 is true, but it's going to be, uh, the Earth is going to be tracing a different path to from the perspective of the sun. Okay, so the question is, I mean, for a case like this, uh, is whether these propositions are genuinely conflicting. And one way to remove the apparent conflict without introducing alternative worlds is what Goodman calls the relativization strategy. So I've just said that motion is relative to one's frame of reference. So we might build that relativization into the claims themselves. So we might take E1 and E2 as abbreviating these propositions. According to the geocentric system, the Earth is at rest. According to the heliocentric system, the Earth moves. And there's nothing conflicting about these statements. They're both true and they do not conflict. Um, now, Goodman objects to this relativization move. And uh, he, he draws this analogy. He says, well, think about these propositions. The king of Sparta had one vote. The king of Sparta had two votes. Uh, the first there is based on a report by Herodot Herodotus, and the second is based on a report by Thucydides. So we can similarly make the relativization move in this case. We can say, ah, um, these claims abbreviate the following. According to Herodotus, the king of Sparta had one vote. According to Thucydides, the king of Sparta had, had two votes. Um, I, uh, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing those names correctly, by the way. Uh, it occurs to me that I don't think I've ever heard the name Thucydides in particular pronounced. So I, I might be getting that completely wrong. Um, OK, so anyway, in this case, it should be quite obvious what the problem is. First of all, these relativized sentences don't tell us anything about the King of Sparta. They tell us about the reports given by Herodotus and Thucydides, respectively. Um, so, you know, I mean, when I say, according to Herodotus, the king of Sparta had one vote, I'm not actually telling you anything about the king of Sparta. I'm telling you something about what Herodotus said. And similarly then, if I say, according to the geocentric system, the Earth is at rest, well, that's perfectly true, yes, but it doesn't tell us anything about the Earth. It doesn't tell us anything about the world, which is the thing that we were originally interested in. Uh, it tells us what is said by a particular system, a particular version, a particular reference frame. But of course, we're not talking about systems or versions or reference frames. When we said that the Earth was at rest, we were talking about the Earth. So one issue with the relativization strategy is that it removes the conflict by essentially changing the subject, right? We're no longer talking about the Earth. We are talking about, uh, about a particular system, a particular version. And I mean, there's a second and connected problem here, which is obviously the fact that a version says something does not make what it says true. Uh, according to some version, you know, the Earth rests on the back of a tortoise. Well, that's true as a description of what is said by a particular version. But the claim that the Earth rests on the back of a tortoise, well, that isn't true. The Earth doesn't rest on the back of a tortoise. And the only context in which we, we would assert that it would be if we were constructing a fiction or something. So in general, we can acknowledge that a version says X while denying that X is actually true. What we would need to add in order to capture the meaning of our original statements is that the version is true. So we would need to assert not just E1R and E2R. We'd also need to assert that uh, the geocentric and heliocentric systems are true, uh, at least with respect to what they say about the Earth. Um, or we'd need to say, you know, the, that the Earth and, and, and the Sun are appropriate reference frames or whatever. But the point is, we'd need to have some way of saying that what is communicated by these versions uh, in what they say about the motion of the Earth is actually true. Uh, and once we do that, we're going to be right back to where we started. We are going to have 
true conflicting versions. So Goodman thinks that this is an example of, um, you know, of, of, of true conflicting versions, versions which say different things about the world, conflicting things about the world, but where both are true. Goodman gives a few other examples. Uh, so in the construction of a mathematical system, we can take different elements as primitive. So L L1, um, every point is made up of a vertical line and a horizontal line. L2, no point is made up of lines. If we take lines as primitives, then L1 is true and L2 is false. On the other hand, if we adopt what, what Goodman calls a uh, Whiteheadian system where points are constructed as classes of nesting volumes, then L2 is true and L1 is false. Um, either way, of course, we can state various mathematical facts in these systems and we can also state various facts about the world because you know, we, we often apply mathematics to understand the world. Um, indeed, we, you know, we, we think of the world as, as having certain mathematical properties. Um, we can talk about particular points and lines through space, say. So um, since we have these different ways of constructing mathematical systems, that's going to lead to different ways of constructing the world. There is a world in which space-time points are constructed out of lines and a world in which they are not. OK, next, here's an example from Hilary Putnam. Um, and this is given in his contributions to the collection Star Making. Putnam asks us to imagine a world, W, containing three atoms, X, Y, and Z. How many objects does W contain? Well, you know, this depends on your, uh, your view of what constitutes uh, material composition. Um, and this is an you know, area where there's a, an enormous amount of debate in, in metaphysics. But um, just to go through this very briefly, so on one extreme view of material composition, for any two objects, there is a further object composed of those objects. This is known as compositional universalism. Um, and this is actually the standard position among metaphysicians, as far as I, uh, as far as I know. I, I believe that um, this is basically the consensus view. Um, and so anyway, uh, what this would mean is that um, there are seven objects in our world W, because you've got X, Y, Z, and then you've got every other way of putting x, y, and z together. Um, and that would lead us to have seven objects. And it doesn't matter, uh, on, on, for the compositional universalist, it doesn't matter like whether uh, x, y, and z are close together or whether they're far apart. Um, on compositional universalism, any two objects compose a further object. So like um, my hand and Donald Trump's hair both compose a, a further object. Um, a very, you know, perhaps an odd object, an object that it would be under normal circumstances a bit strange to pick out, um, but that's a genuine object. Um, you know, similarly like this table, uh, the Pacific Ocean and an electron in the Andromeda galaxy uh, all compose uh, an object. Um, so, as I say, you know, I mean, you can look up material composition and universalism if you're interested in the debates here, but this is... Um, this is one position, right? We can just say that for any two objects, there is a further object composed of them. And then you get seven objects in our world W. On the other hand, another extreme view of material composition is compositional nihilism, which is the view that two parts never compose a further object. There are, there are no objects that have parts. So uh, on this view, there are only three objects in our universe, just X, Y, and Z. Um, that's it. And so, uh, nihilism, again, applied to, to this world would entail that actually, like, the table in front of me isn't an object. Uh, only the uh, the atoms are. Or, well, not even the atoms, but, you know, whatever the, um, the basic fundamental uh, particles are. Okay, then there's going to be middle positions, which hold that parts sometimes but not always compose a further object. Maybe parts only compose an object when they're in physical contact with each other, for instance. Uh, in, in that case, the number of objects in, the, in our world will depend on the exact arrangement of the atoms. So if we suppose that in our world X and Y are both close together, they're both touching, while Z is further away, then on a view which says that parts compose an object when they're in physical contact, we would have four objects. We would have X, Y, Z, and then X plus Y. So anyway, um, 
Here are three propositions. W contains seven objects, W contains three objects, W contains four objects. Different principles of material composition will create different versions. And the claim is going to be these different versions are conflicting and all true. Um, so, I mean, again, are these, are these really conflicting? Uh, Putnam notes that one response to this is to say, well, look, there is, you know, there's just one world here, but we can choose how to slice it up. Uh, the world is, is like a piece of dough uh, to which we can apply the cookie cutter in different ways, depending on, you know, depending on what we count as being useful or whatever. Um, so, like, we, we can carve it up into three objects or four or seven or, or any, really, depending on, um, you know, what principles of material composition we want to use. But Putnam says, look, this kind of so this view this view that there's 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 one world there and then we choose how to slice it up that's just going to raise the question of okay but what are the parts of this dough um, so if we say that x y and z are the parts of the dough then it's going to turn out that on is the correct description that nihilism provides the correct version the other descriptions would be false but perhaps useful pragmatically on the other hand if if we say that uh, you know x, y, z, x plus y, x plus z, and, and so on. If we say that all those are parts of the dough, then OU is the correct description and all the others false. Compositional universalism is going to be the correct version and the others will be false. So the, the problem here is that it's, um, it's, it's not possible to give a neutral description of what the parts of the world are, right? If we describe the world as just containing x, y, z, if we say, well, those are the parts of the world, then actually you've described it in nihilistic terms. Um, whereas if you list uh, x, y, z, x plus y, x plus z, etc., then you've described it in universalist terms. Um, so uh, Putnam thinks that there is a genuine conflict here. Um, and he also thinks that this is a case where all of these have equal claim to the truth, at least. OK, a final example given by Goodman. Um, appeals to psychological experiments on apparent motion. When two spots are close to one another and flash on and off in a short interval, this creates the illusion of one spot moving from the first position to the second. So consider S1, a spot moves across the screen, and S2, no spot moves across the screen. Goodman says that both S1 and S2 are true. S1 is true in a phenomenalist perspective. So if we're thinking of experience in terms of sense data or qualia, um, then this is this is true, right? So from this from this point of view, from the phenomenalist point of view, they will say, look, if it appears that an object has some property, then there really is something of which we are aware that has that property. So if it appears that an object is moving, then there really is something that is in motion. Um, you know, maybe not a physical object, but at least a mental object, a sense datum. Like if I'm looking at a screen and I and something seems to be moving, then there really is something that is in motion. Um, maybe a, a mental object, a sense data or a qualia or, or whatever. On the other hand, um, S2 is true and S1 is false under a physicalist uh, perspective. In this perspective, we describe the situation purely in terms of the uh, pixels that compose the screen and, and then the light rays and then the pattern of brain activation and so on. Um, so under the phenomenalist framework there is one moving spot, under the physicalist framework there are two spots and neither of them move. Um, both of these perspectives are equally adequate. And notice that the phenomenalist perspective is not, you know, it's not a competing physical theory. It wouldn't be ruled out by empirical discoveries uh, in in the way that we can decide between, say, different accounts of the structure of DNA. Um, there isn't really an empirical test that could decide between the phenomenalist or the physicalist version, at least as Goodman sees it. Um, from the physicalist point of view, the perceptual experience is a distorted form of the physical facts. From the phenomenalist point of view, the physical theory provides a, a kind of highly artificial rendering of the perceptual facts. But both of these can be made into perfectly acceptable world versions. And obviously there are, you know, there are perfectly reasonable contexts where we, we describe things in terms of the phenomenalist version and other contexts where we apply the physical, physicalist version. Okay then, 
So, we have several apparent cases of versions that are true uh, but conflicting. Now, obviously, there are alternative positions we might take about these cases. We might hold uh, that only one of the conflicting versions is true. Um, this would correspond to option B in the first form of Goodman's argument. Or we might hold that the versions are not really conflicting. Um, this would correspond to option C. We've already looked at some ways of um, developing these responses, such as the relativization strategy. Uh, relativization strategy obviously tries to show that the versions are not really conflicting. But um, it's worth going through these in a little bit more detail. So, OK, first then. One response to um, the presentation of apparently true conflicting versions is to say, well, only one of those versions is actually true. Um, and I mean, this is uh, like a tricky part of the argument for Goodman, because we do, after all, frequently rule that descriptions of the world are false. Um, so there are plenty of cases where there have been, you know, there, there have been versions that we have constructed, um, which seemed to have been adequate, but then we've later found out that, no, they're false. We no longer talk about witches or caloric or phlogiston, for instance. Um, so in our example of perceiving the spot, the standard position will probably be that the physicalist version is just true. Uh, the physicalist version has, has shown that the phenomenalist version is wrong. Um, it's just false that there is one moving spot. Yes, it appears that there is a moving spot, but appearances are deceiving. And we know, given how the screen actually operates, that there is no moving spot. Um, in fact, yeah, I mean, more generally, notice that even if we're unable to give a reason for preferring one version to another, we could always just adopt an agnostic position. We could say, well, only one of these versions is true. We just don't know which one. Um, OK, so in response to this, Goodman takes it to be implausible that for every pair of apparently true conflicting versions, all but one will be eliminated. And there are two points here. First of all, note that while specific cases of conflict have sometimes been resolved, the general existence of conflicting versions is not something that, that ever really gets resolved by further inquiry. So if we take two versions, v1 and v2, well, yes, we may well be able to decide that only one of these is true. We may well uh, be able to say, you know, in, in the course of inquiry, actually, it turns out v2 is just wrong. But, but these new arguments and new findings will often end up themselves supporting a variety of other conflicting versions, you know, we'll end up generating v3 and v4 and so on. Uh, so there's just no reason to think in general, that that these conflicts will be resolved in favour of one specific version. A second point here is to consider how we go about eliminating versions. In the cases of caloric and phlogiston, this was through empirical study. We devised hypotheses, made predictions, made observations. We found that the observations failed to match the predictions. Um, I mean, this was by, you know, it was, it was through applying scientific empirical techniques uh, that we ended up eliminating these theories. And much the same occurred with belief in witches, although, of course, you know, witches were never really part of a scientific hypothesis. Um, but even even so, I mean, our observations of how the world actually worked ended up just sort of showing us that, no, there, there aren't really people who are in league with the devil casting curses and, and so on. Um, so, OK, how would that kind of thing apply to the different accounts of material composition, say, or to the debate between phenomenalist and physicalist accounts of perception? In those cases, there doesn't seem to be any observation we could make or even imagine that would decide between these versions. Um, so, I mean, the, the general point here is that there seem to be cases where the criteria of adequacy for our representations of the world can be satisfied in multiple ways. No matter how stringent we make these criteria, they they will remain multiply satisfiable if they are satisfiable at all. Um, so, I mean, you can always adopt an alternative view of material composition. Um, you know, you can always sort of frame, uh, uh, you can always frame objects in 
different ways and there really isn't anything that can empirically refute a particular account there. Um, at best only pragmatic factors can decide between those different versions. So um, so yeah, there, there, there are just going to be cases, Goodman thinks, where uh, no, we're not going to be able to uh, eliminate uh, or, or there's just no reason to think that only one of the conflicting versions is true. Okay, this brings us to the second response, which is to say that actually when you have these apparently true conflicting versions, they are not really conflicting. Both versions are true, but they can be reconciled. We saw that the relativization strategy is one way to do this, but that faces some serious problems. Another option, um, and this is maybe might be more popular actually, is uh, via what we might call capturing. Um, in particular, uh, reduction, re reducing one version to another um, is the standard way to do this. So take the example of perception, which can be, uh, as we saw, accounted for in either phenomenalist or physicalist terms. Well, the idea is that the phenomenalist version is, is captured within the physicalist version. We have theories of perception which detail how the brain interprets information from the world um, and that explain why we see uh, these two flashing spots as a single spot apparently moving. Um, and, well, I'm actually not sure if we have the theories for that at the moment, but we're working on developing such theories and it looks like you know, one day we may well have such theories. Um, so the point is the physical version explains or perhaps one day will explain the appearance of a single spot moving. Now this does not go both ways. The phenomenalist version provides no resources for explaining the claims made in the physicalist version. So there's a, there's a significant asymmetry here. So if we take our statements, uh, a spot moves across the screen and no spot moves across the screen. Well, on this approach, S2 is straightforwardly true. S1 is also true, but it's given a non-literal interpretation. So in S1, spot and screen are taken to refer to you know, mental objects, sense data quality or whatever, images in the mind. And these can then be explained by the physical images on the computer screen causing particular changes in the neurons of the brain. Basically, S1 and S2 are describing different things, and the physicalist version can explain all of these things. And then the claim is that this can be generalized to many other cases. Every true version can be translated or reduced to a single version, uh, which traditionally we would expect that single unifying version to be stated in the language of physics. We can give a complete physical description of the changing relative positions of objects, which will accommodate our two statements about the motion of the Earth. We can give a complete physical description of the atoms in the universe, which accommodates different claims about the number of objects. Um, if you state all the physical facts, then you have stated all the facts, period, including all the facts that might be stated by other versions. Okay, so one response to this is to take a line um, to take a similar line uh, as, as the response to the previous objection. So just as there is no reason to think that all conflicting versions bar one will be shown to be false, there's no reason to think that this kind of reductionism can actually be achieved. Uh, I mean, just take just the sciences, right? Um, and I mean, as we saw, there are many versions beyond science, but even if we just look at science, will all sciences be reduced to physics? Well, the argument will be that there's no reason to expect uh, that we will ever be able to state all the facts about psychology and ecology, say, in the language of physics. Um, and, in, you know, what's more, it's worth noting that even when there are cases of apparent reduction of one version to another, closer analysis often reveals that the relationships between the versions are uh, more complex than, than might initially have appeared. So think, for example, of how we often treat molecular biology and biochemistry as establishing a reduction from biology to chemistry. Well, what actually happened here was something more like splitting. Um, it's not that biology became subsumed into chemistry. It's not that, you know, okay, suddenly we just all just do chem. suddenly they're just doing chemistry now. Uh, rather, a field in between biology and chemistry arose which coordinated the two sciences in various ways without actually uniting them. Um, in many ways, we haven't achieved a smooth reduction uh, from biological theories and biological models to chemistry. Um, so the assumption that 
all will be reduced to physics simply amounts to, yeah, I mean, at, at best, a faith. Hilary Putnam, in his article Reflections on Goodman's Ways of World Making, uh, makes a related point on, on this subject. And Putnam worries that the idea that everything can be captured in a physicalist version is only is only going to seem plausible if you already assume physicalism, uh, if you assume that physical theory explains all the facts. Now Putnam says, look, we can we can accept physicalism in a broad sense, right, without supposing that it actually captures all the other versions. In particular, we can accept the supervenience claim that there can be no change in any given state without a change in the physical states. So all things in the world supervene on the physical. Um, and supervenience, if you are not aware, is just a, a technical term in philosophy. To say that A supervenes on B is to say that there can be no change in A without a change in B. So we can, we can accept this claim that there can be no change in any fact right, without a change in the physical facts. We can accept that without accepting that physical theory explains all the relevant facts. Uh, in, a, in a similar way, Putnam says, uh, perhaps it's the case that nothing ever happens without a gravitational change. Uh, maybe ev everything that occurs, I mean, you, you, know, you can imagine, right? And we needn't suppose that this is actually true of the world, but we can imagine that everything that occurs in the world occurs with a gravitational change. But we would not think that a theory that predicted all gravitational changes is thereby a complete theory that explains everything. Um, Putnam gives the, the following example. Suppose we are among a community of art experts. We look at the painting called The Polish Rider and we say, this painting has the characteristic Rembrandt paint quality. Now, physical science may in some sense explain the sensations that we have when we look at The Polish Rider. It can tell us about the materials composing the painting. It can tell us about the spectral surface reflectances of the painting and the passage of light from the painting to our eyes and the pattern of activation on the retina and the pattern of neuron fi firings and so on. Uh, and we, we, you know, we might apply it to other paintings as well and compare how the brain responds to these different objects. So we have, in a sense, a physical explanation of the sensations on observing the painting. But the point is we are interested in the Rembrandt quality of the Polish writer, and physical science may well provide an explanation of our sensations, but it won't provide an explanation of them under this description. Uh, a Rembrandt quality is simply not something that physics will recognise as part of the furniture of the world. In other words, unless you are already committed to physicalism, there's just no reason to take an explanation of the pattern of neuron firings, say, as an explanation of the characteristic Rembrandt paint quality. Um, and indeed, you know, if we're talking about paintings in a community of art critics, we're probably not looking for a causal explanation at all, right? We're not trying to construct causal models of how brains respond to paintings. Uh, that's just the wrong kind of explanation. I mean, compare, like, you know, you can pick up a book on, on colour science, say, or a book on psychological or neurological models of perception and emotion. That's some. That's a very different thing from reading a book on art criticism or on the biography of an artist or something like that. It's quite clear that these are doing very different things. Um, so, you know, Putnam would say, look, other versions are captured within the physicalist version or reduced to the physicalist version only if we already take the perspective of physicalism, right? Only if we're already assuming that that physicalism provides like an account of all there is. Um, because there's just a lot of stuff that you're not going to be able to do with a physical theory and, you know, talking and engaging in a lot of art criticism is one of those things. So for all these reasons, Goodman and others are sceptical that all true versions can be reduced to a single version. Uh, there is a further difficulty with the uh, capturing response or the reduction response, and this is that physics itself is not a unified enterprise. Uh, physics is, as Goodman says, fragmentary. Consider, what exactly is the language of physics? Well, we don't mean to include, say, 18th century physics. We don't mean to include caloric and the luminiferous ether. 
uh, because those have been superseded. Um, but what's more, we, we can't mean contemporary physics either. After all, we know that contemporary physics is incomplete and in some respects probably radically wrong. Um, I mean, you, you know, general relativity and quantum theory are incompatible. So we know there are going to be changes in the future to physics as we currently understand it. Uh, future investigation will change then what we take the physical facts to be. So when we suggest that all versions will be reduced to physics, what exactly is it that we're saying all of these versions are going to be reduced to? Um, I mean, that, so the, the claim here will be, look, we have absolutely no grasp on what the one true physics is even supposed to be, right? This is just an idea without content. So in saying that all other versions will be reduced to it, we are, we are saying nothing. Um, so uh, these are the, uh, the objections then to the... Um, reduction response. Okay then, let's remind ourselves of Goodman's many worlds argument. So all of this that I have uh, just outlined, Goodman takes it, establishes premise one. Right, that's the, the argument for the claim that there are true conflicting versions and the response to some of the objections to uh, that argument. There are then true conflicting versions. There are versions which say contradictory things, but where each of them is true, uh, or at least Goodman thinks he has established that. That leaves us with premise two and premise three, and we can deal with these quite a bit more quickly. Premise two, to each true version answers a world. Premise two basically amounts to the claim that to every true description of reality, to every you know, to every accurate representation of reality, there are the objects, properties, and relations given in that representation. So take the cat is on the mat. Let's suppose that this is true. Well, then we must be committed to the existence of a cat, a mat, and a particular relation between these objects. Uh, we don't have to give any particular account of the underlying metaphysical nature of cats, mats, and spatial relations, but if we think that the claim the cat is on the mat is true, then we're surely committed to a world to which it answers. Um, you know, I mean, if otherwise we'd just be constructing a fiction or something like that. Um, you know, so when I say right now that the cat is in my room, well, that's false because hey, I'm in my room and there's no cat here, right? There, there is an object in the world. You know, there's a room, right? But there's no cat in it. So. The point of, of premise two is not to commit us to any particular metaphysical claim. It's just the common sense idea that, like, if you say something like the cat is on the mat, in order for that to be true, there has to be the stuff referred to by the claim. There has to be the cat and the mat related in the right way. Premise three, true conflicting versions cannot answer to one and the same world. Well, uh, denying this would amount to taking option A in the previous form of the argument that we gave. Um, premise three, again, not particularly controversial. If there are conflicting propositions that are true of the same world, that would just be to say that the world is contradictory. Both a proposition and its negation uh, are true of the same world. Most philosophers have found this absurd because they take the principle of non-contradiction to be inviolable. Uh, Goodman certainly dismisses this position without much argument. Um, but I mean, we might worry at this point because there are philosophers who have defended dialetheism, the position that there are true contradictions. And, you know, is dialetheism really any more absurd than Goodman's claim that there are many actual worlds all made by us? Uh, I mean, both of these are, are pretty radical positions in contemporary philosophy. I mean, one thing that I that can be said here is even most dialetheists, even most of those who take it that there are true contradictions, they will tend to strictly limit the contexts in which true contradictions occur. Um, so you know, they, they, they will take it that, you know, true contradictions might arise because of linguistic phenomena such as the liar paradox or other semantic paradoxes. For Goodman, as we've seen, true conflicting versions arise, you know, even when we're talking about the motions of planets or the qualities of paintings or the number of objects in a room or whatever. Um, and dialetheism is going to start to look less and less plausible um, the more contexts in which we have to appeal to it. Um, so, you know, 
most people are going to take premise three for granted. Um, so there you have it. That's that's Goodman's many worlds argument. There are many actual worlds, and we make worlds by making versions. Um, so, yeah, that's the argument. <laughs>